Uh, so, uh, at the end of the last class, we almost completed our discussion of uh, orbifolds. Uh, there is just one thing left to say, okay. And uh, um, that one thing left to say um, is this. That, uh, you remember, you remember uh, the orbifolds we were talking about, you remember the twisted sector states that were localized around the fixed point, the untwisted sector states that behaved like they were propagating around in flat space, except that uh, all st untwisted sector states had to be invariant under x goes to minus x. Okay, so uh, they projected; they, they were ordinary states, but invariant under x goes to minus x. Um, then there were the twisted sector states that were propagating around there. We we described the set of untwisted sector states, the set of twisted sector states, and we also uh, uh, described a formula for the partition function of these states. We computed the uh, torus partition function. Okay, now um, uh, suppose we have a circle and an orbifold. Okay, so suppose we're looking at the theory under the restriction x is the same thing as x plus 2 pi r, that's a circular identification. And also x is the same as minus x. Okay, so we want to impose both these projections simultaneously on our x field. Okay, this is an orbifold of a circle compactification. Okay, uh, this theory behaves very similar to uh, the uh, orbifold of a flat line of the, of, the, of, uh, um, of a non-compact space, except that there are two twisted sector states. This is what I want to explain. Okay, consider a circle. Okay, which is these are the identifications. So this is zero, two pi r, uh, four pi r, six pi r. Then there is minus 2 pi r, and so on. So a circle is just the line under this identification, under this, la this lattice identification. I've drawn the lattice at the bottom. Okay? Now, in addition, we've got this identification with x goes to minus x. Okay? I want to know what are the non-trivial twisted sector states in this theory. What are the non-trivial twisted sector states? So of course, there's one set of twisted sector states, which are states that wind around the circle. Okay, these guys will then be just projected under x goes to minus x. We'll only keep the even states in, in this. So this is playing the role of the untwisted sector states of, of our straight line theory. Just like the straight line theory, the untwisted sector states were just the usual ones, except that we kept only the even ones. Similarly, we can keep all the states that we have in ordinary circle compactification, except that we keep only even things. Okay, this is as before. What's uh, interesting is what happens in the twisted sector. Okay, so wh what happens in the twisted sector? Well, let's try to understand what the twisted sector states look like. Suppose I have a, um, a string that starts off here. After it winds around 2 pi on the world sheet, where can it end up? Well, of course, it could end up in circle, circle compactification, like winding, but we're not looking at, we're not worried about those cases. Those are already taken into account. So one thing it can do is end up here, okay? Another thing it can do is go here, but that would be a winding state. But it can also end up here because this point is the same as this point because reflection around x is the same as reflection around 2 pi because 2 pi is the same point as 0, okay? So this is another thing it could do. You see, this thing is a, uh, is, is, is a state that has a fixed point, not at zero, but at pi. Okay, let me say that again. I want to show you that pi here is a fixed point. Of what? Central. Center of mass sits around pi. I want to show you that pi is a fixed point of these combined identifications. This is obvious. Suppose I take pi, and I go to, I, I do x goes to minus x. I go to minus pi. But then I get, go to, I mean, pi r. Right? Pi r, I always mean pi r. So pi r, 
I do x goes to minus x goes to minus pi r. But then I go to x goes to x plus 2 pi r. So it brings, brings me back to pi r. Is that clear? So the combination of x goes to minus x and x goes to x plus 2 pi r, these operations, first this, then that, leaves the point x is equal to pi r fixed. But n pi r, yes, it's true. We could, uh, we could do all of these as fixed points of one or, one or the other sets of identification. But you see, we already have the circle identification. So it's only points between 0 and 2 pi r that are different. Okay? So the total number of distinct fixed points on the circle is 2. There's one at 0 and there's one at pi r. Okay? Um, so uh, uh, when we compute the partition function, Oh, or oh, oh, if we want to look at the states of this theory, we have two twisted sector states. One at zero, one at pi. Okay? And uh, uh, these twisted sector strings, you know, can go and become as long as they like. Uh, of course, it costs energy to become long. But they, be they can go and become as long as they can. Sort of go around the circle as many times as they want. They're not seeing the circle identification. Okay? Because they just become very long things. So the twisted, the partition function in the twisted sector of this theory is basically identical to the partition function of the twisted sector in the uncompactified theory. Okay? There's no center of mass motion. You see, the circle and the uncompactified theory differed in two ways. A, because center of mass motion was projected to be you know, momentum was projected to be integer, but here in the twisted sector there's no center of mass motion. And B, because you had winding sectors. But we're not looking at winding sectors. We're looking at these strings that are center of mass linked terms. Okay? There are two center of masses. There's zero and pi. But let's look at any one of them. The strings around any one of them behave identical to uh, x equals minus x twisted sector strings just in flat space. Okay? And therefore, the partition function for this theory is identical to the partition function that we wrote down in the last class, except that the untwisted sector is replaced by the circle compactification. Then we have the projection of the circle compactification, the 1 plus p by 2. Okay? Plus we have two of the twisted sector states. Okay? So at the same time, I'm not going to write down the formulas. It's just the same as in the last class. You can look them up if you want in Pulchinsky. But you understand that we know the answer. Is this clear? Okay? <laughs> Uh, there's no zero modes. We saw that into physically it's clear there are no zero modes because this thing is stuck somewhere. Right? The whole thing cannot move. Technically, we saw that last class because uh, in, the, uh, in the twisted sectors, the, or, uh, the uh, oscillators were not integer quantized but half integer quantized. And half integer quantized guys lack a zero mode. The zero mode was the guy which is zero, right? That's, not a half, no. That's an integer, not a half integer. Okay? So these guys are stuck there. They're not. They can't move overall. They can oscillate around this thing, but they can't move overall. Okay? And so they don't really see the difference between being on a circle and not. That's the point. There are two different twisted sectors. There's one around zero, there's one around pi. So we just take the twisted sector partition function we wrote down in class last time, multiply it by two. Okay? And then there is, in the untwisted sector, sector we know we're on a circle. So we get the circle compactification by 2 plus project on circle compactification by 2. So you remember the projector was just taking x to minus x as you went around, right? Okay, so this is, and the effect of that on, uh, um, uh, the effect of that on the zero modes was as before. I, I plan not to go through this, but just to remind you, 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 remind, you remember that in the partition function way of looking at it, uh, in the trace way of looking at it, we impose the projector onto these, these states by imposing a 1 plus p by 2. 1 by 2 is just the circle compactification partition function. p was taking x to minus x as you went around. That projected out all non-trivial um, states in the zero mode sector. Because it took winding to minus winding and momentum to, mo uh, to minus momentum. So only momentum and winding equals zero contribute. Okay? And it had its effect on the oscillators. 
instead of the oscillators being 1 minus q to the power n, it became 1 plus q to the power n. You remember this, right? You remember that this was the sort of path integral way of seeing it. In the Hamiltonian way of seeing it, uh, we had an, another way of seeing it, right? We, we, which this uh, Harshal helped, helped us to get those straight. All this you remember, right? Okay, good. So I'm not going through that again. I would have gone through it last class, except we were we were being pushed out. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would have liked to go through this part last class, so it was clear in your mind. But okay. So we have the part, the formula for the partition function of a, of a, of an orbifold on a torus. That was the punchline. Now, the reason I started talking about orbifolds uh, was to tell you about the space of C equals one theory. But um, so what have we got so far? We found some new theories at C equals 1. We had these, these theories which were circle compactifications. Remember, we're always working at alpha prime equals 2. This guy was at square root alpha prime, so square root 2. Then we found there was the theory at 2, which was the bosonized theory. Uh, at the end of this class, I'll tell you a little bit more about the Bosonized theory. I mean, motivated by a question that Aryaman asked me yesterday uh, about theory models, but I'll save that for the end of the class. Okay, this class, this this guy here, which was, um, yeah, uh, okay, something special is going to happen. I haven't yet told you about this, but there's a special point which we're going to see in this lecture. Just two square root two. Yes, that's where the line will go. Okay. But so far, what we have seen is that there is another class of theories, which are orbifolds of circles. OK? This other class of theories is also labeled by its radius. So it also starts at square root 2, and then goes up to whatever. You can take an orbifold of a, of a, of a circle at square root 2, or you can take an orbifold of a circle at any value of the radius. Original circle at square root through an uh, r and 1 by r and square root 2 by r were the same. That's why it only starts at square root 2. We found two lines of theories. Now, often in this kind of physics, well, the kind of physics we do, um, some of the most beautiful moments that happen in physics is when you see connections between two things that you thought were previously unrelated. So now, at this point, what we've seen is one line of theories this way, one line of theories that way. And you might ask, is there a connection between these two lines? By which I mean, do these two lines meet someone? Now, at first it sounds like the answer is no. One of them is a circle of a free boson. The other is an orbifold of a circle of a free boson. What is the connection between the two? They're different, right? Geometrically, they look very different. A circle is a circle with an identification. An orbifold looks like an interval, an inter interval of length pi r, right? Because points here are the same as there, so the only non-trivial, the only independent points are in this interval of length. Intervals and circles look different, but we should be careful. We've already seen an example in, in this kind of physics where things that look different geometrically are actually the same in physics. The example we've seen is t-duality. A circle of radius alpha prime by r, a small circle is actually the same as a big circle. So we should just be wary about this Geometrical intuition, when things are small, when uh, our lengths are small of order alpha prime, geomet geometrical intuition can go badly wrong. Okay? So let's try to think a little harder. The way we're going to work is the following. There's this a beautiful argument, which I, I don't know, probably is originally in some paper, but I got from Pulchinsky. It's a beautiful argument, which I'm going to present to you. Okay. Uh, Let's start as follows. Let us let's start with um, the theory, the circle S1 theory at radius square root 2. This is our starting point. This was the theory, if you remember, that had SU2 times SU2 symmetry. Okay? Remember that the, ver the vertex operators of the, the of the SU2 times SU2 currents were n equals w is equal to plus minus 1, and n is equal to minus w is equal to plus minus 1. This plus del x 
and this plus del bar x gave you the uh, the currents of the SU2 theory. Okay, remember the form of the currents was e to the power i uh, square root two plus minus x l and del x. Where if you take del, it's only left moving. Also e to the power i uh, plus minus i square root two x r and del bar x r. You remember that these currents were of the form j plus minus and j z and j, let's call them j bar plus minus and j z. Okay, so this theory has this very large symmetry, this SU2 symmetry that was non-geometrical because its currents including wind, it included winding modes. So it's not something you see from point particle physics. Okay, and uh, um, uh, we're going to try to use this symmetry to make some deductions. Okay, so the first thing we do is the following. Let's look at the circle compactification at radius r is equal to square root 2 by 2, which is the same as square root 2 times 2 by t dual. But I'm going to use this frame so it's easier to think. Okay, now you see, suppose I've got a circle of length of some circumference, and I want to halve the circumference. That's equivalent to working in the original circle and orbifolding folding by a shift of half the circle length. Yeah, so suppose I have a circle of 2 pi r, of, of circumference 2 pi r, or of, let's say radius r, and I want to now work with the circle of radius r by 2. Okay, of course I could just start with this line theory and mod out by shifts by 2 pi r by 2. But I could also do the following, I could first work with the, take this theory which is circle with 2 pi r identification, and then in that theory mod out by the one extra shift you need to, namely x goes to x plus pi r, just a z2 shift in this theory. Is this clear? Just this extra z2, because z goes to z plus, uh, plus pi, uh, 2 pi r was already modded out. So it's just one extra thing that I have to mod out by. Just one z2 orbifold. Is this clear? So halving the length of the circle is doing a z2 to orbifold on the original circle theory. Actually, it's a nice exercise for those of you who want to, to check that you get the partition function correct this way. So write down the partition function as an orbifold. Partition function of the, the of the circle of length r by 2 as an orbifold of the partition function of, uh, partition function of the theory with length r. Then once again you have to do two things. You have twisted sector states and untwisted sector states. The untwisted sector states have to be modded out by this extra shift and the twisted sector states basically introduce the extra windings. It's a nice exercise to see that this procedure gives you back what you already know to be the partition function of the theory with r by 2. Okay, it's logically clear it should have worked, right? but it's nice to see it working in equations. Okay, but I'm going to assume that, that, that you guys are hardworking and you'll check this exercise, do this exercise by yourself and we move on. <laughs> okay, so what we want to do to go from the theory from, of at radius square root 2 to the theory at radius square root 2 by 2 is to mod out by a particular z2 shift. Now what is that z2 shift? Well, that z2 shift is merely translations on the circle by length pi r. But translation is one of the currents. The generator of translations is one of the currents of ISU2 algebra. In fact, it is jz plus jz bar. Because del x was the generator of currents, of translations. Okay? And del x, uh, del x was the generator of translations in x left. Del bar x was the generator of translations in x right. So del x plus del bar x translates to full x. Okay. Now, in our. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I believe you are going to use this S2 algebra by doing this modding. So I just want to know whether this. We know that this S2 algebra is correct at radius root 2. Yes. But now we will we are modding out and going to square root 2 by 2 hmm. but does this algebra still exist at that time no okay. 
We are going to use the SU2 algebra at radius root 2 to understand, to get a new representation of, of the circle at root 2 by 2. Okay, because the circle at root 2 by 2 is the circle at root 2 modded out. Now the circle at root 2 has the SU2 algebra. Okay, so we're going to word this modding out in group theory terms. Is this clear? Excellent, but excellent question. Okay, so what we have to mod out by is a rotation around the z axis simultaneously, z axis in left and right part. That's clear. How big should that rotation be? Well, we already know that a 2 pi rotation, okay, uh, that a 2 pi rotation is going to leave us fixed. Okay, uh, you might be worried about whether it gives you a minus sign or not, but there are two of them. Because you're going to do it on left and right, so any minus sign will become minus one to minus one. So two pi rotation will leave us fixed. Okay? So what we need, want to do is a pi rotation, a rotation by pi, because the two pi rotation clearly is a full circle identification. Right? So what we want to do now is to mod out by rotations by pi. So we've got a great set of words. The words are mod out your theory by rotations by pi around the z-axis simultaneously about left z and right z. And and this z you mean the some x's or the, uh, the complex plane? No, no, z is this. In SU2, we had j plus minus okay. and jz. It's ro rotations of around the z, this fictional z-axis. There's no z-axis on. Okay? Great. So that gives us a circle identification of at square root 2. Fine, so you think, so what? But look, we have this SU2 algebra. Now in SU2, in a theory that has symmetry under SU2, you're not allowed, I mean, you can say do a, red, a rotation around the z axis by pi. But that should be equivalent to rotation around any axis by pi. Because the theory had invariance under SU2. And you know that every axis can be rotated to every other by an SU2 rotation. So let us try, I will have to figure out whether I want to do x or y in a minute. Let us now try to do a rotation. Uh, what we get should be the same thing as if we take our theory at this L-tuled radius and mod out by simultaneous rotations around the x-axis. I may have to change that as we do the algebra to the y-axis just to get convenient representation. Both could be independent, right? What? Both could be independent? Yes, yes. you could do either x-axis or y-axis, but you have to do whatever you do on the left movers, the same on the right movers because that's what you did on the previous guy. Okay. Now, Thank you. Okay. So now, since we're working with real axes, let's write these currents down in real terms. So there was jx, which was equal to e to the power ix plus e to the power minus i square root 2. And JZ, which is del X, I think XLI. Okay. And uh, um, then there are the, the guides on the right as well. I'm not writing. No, for the right movers, the left movers, right movers. Now, I'm going to do a rotation by pi around the 
um, around the uh, uh, x axis. What? No rotation around the z axis. I will do rotation by pi around the x axis. But now let us see. First, let us note the following thing. Before I do change, let me note the following thing. Note that when I did my rotation around the z axis, okay, what happened to jx and jy? So jx, you see the rotation around the, the z axis was taking this and transport, translating it by half the radius. Radius was 1 over square root 2. Half the radius is 1 over square root 2 by 2. Uh, and then of course with the 2 pi. So if we do that, we get 2 pi times 1 over square root 2 by 2. So this changes by pi, e to the pi pi. Is this clear? This also changes by, this changes by e to the pi minus i pi. But there's this wonderful identity of mathematics that e to the power minus i pi is equal to e to the power i pi, which is equal to 1, uh, minus 1. Okay, so jx under this shift went to minus jx under that original shift. And jy went to minus jy. And of course, that that was the case had to be, right? You do a rotation around the z axis by 180 degrees x-axis goes to minus itself, y-axis goes to minus itself. There is an obvious thing, okay, just a little consistency check of this idea. Okay? So, now, if, if on the other hand, we do a rotation around the x-axis by 180 degrees, jy and jz should go to minus themselves. Okay? Fine. So, the thing that should be equivalent to working with the theory at radius root 2 by 2 should be some action on the fields that has the property that it takes jy to minus jy and jz to minus jz. But there's a very simple action on the field that does that. It's x goes to minus x. Because jz is del x, so under x goes to minus x, it goes to minus x. jy was sine, so under x goes to minus x, it goes to minus minus it. Okay? Uh, so this is at least motivation and one can slightly more seriously take through this argument to show that rotation by pi rotation by pi is implement uh, around j axis around uh, x axis is implemented by by x goes to minus x in the theory at r is equal to root Is this clear? Okay? Then we would get another representation of equivalent physics. Right. But let's hang on for a moment and rotate, sorry, around the z axis. Around the z axis. That, that was what we did originally. We rotated around the z axis and we saw that, that what that did was to reduce our radius by half. No, but if we do x goes to minus x, then, uh, then it's not happening for j. No, no. Let's, let's look at the logic. We started with this theory at radius square root 2. We did pi rotations around both z axes. That took the circle to minus half, to half times the circle. Now we did pi rotations around both x axes. Okay? We did pi rotations around both x axes. That took the circle, didn't change the length of the circle, but uh, induced the identification x goes to minus x. Therefore, our conclusion is that the theory, ordinary circle compactification at radius square root 2 by 2 is the same as the orbifold, x goes to minus x orbifold, of the theory at radius square root. Yes. Let's look at what we did. I'll write it down.
theory at r equals square root 2. We start with this. This is the self dual radius where the SU2. We do two different things. Or before it, any word that I'm not using, that I'm using, you're not understanding, you should stop me because that shouldn't stop. You know, people, especially mathematicians, love to use complicated words for very simple things. And you get used to doing that. And it's a terrible thing to do. You know, so you shouldn't let that stop your understanding. Oh. By pi z axis simultaneously on left and right. Okay, this gives you circle. So when I say S1 at radius r, gives you S1 at radius square root 2 by 2. Was this part clear? Was this clear? Not clear. Okay, let's start that again. You know, what is, what is an orbifolding of a circle by radius 2 pi r? It's taking the real line and identifying the points on this lattice. 0, 2 pi r, 4 pi r, minus 2 pi r. You got it? Uh, clear to everyone? Shall I go? Okay? So this guy is S1 at radius square root 2 by 2. Correct? Next thing we argued by looking at the action on currents was if we ought to be fold by pi rotations around x axis, left and right. We get S1 or before this is x goes to minus x. That was x goes to minus x at r is equal to square root 2. But these two operations were SU2 related, so they're the same operation. So they should give you the same theory. Okay? And so we claim that these two theories are equal to each other. If you do in the y-axis, we will get some other representation, but nothing very new. You know what we will get? Uh, now it would be some combination of uh, a shift and an x goes to minus x. Okay, but it will be nothing new. Some other representation of the same theory. Okay, yeah, because the shift will do this and yeah, something. I think exactly a shift in x goes to minus x. Okay, so uh, fine. What have we concluded? We've concluded that these or before branch of theories, which looked completely different from the circle compactifications, are in general completely different. But there is one value of the radius where they match, namely. If you take the circle theories and go like this, this is square root 2, this was 2, the bosonization point, this was 2 square root 2. This matches the orbifold theory at square root 2 and higher. Because the orbifold at square root 2 is same as circle at 2 by square root 2, but circle at 2 by square root 2 which is the same as circle at 2 times square root 2. Okay, so we are claiming that this is the actual moduli space of theories. Okay, there are the orbifold theories, there are the circle compactification theories. One, in general, they're different, but at one point they meet, and in a very non trivial way, they meet where the circle theory at 2 square root 2 is the same as the orbifold theory at square root 2. 
Now, is this is the claim clear? Please. So in the left, uh, the left cap, uh, you had there is one uh, one application that is two by that, and that is generated by the other. Well, uh, that 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 one, go on. That is generated by the other. Uh, I mean, that is translation on uh, by two pi uh, by, by some yeah. That is by the yes. And so I, I, maybe I didn't. Yes, yes, yes. It's just coming back to the same point. Yeah, it's just coming back to the same point. I'm saying uh, this transformation x going to x plus two pi is generated by the other is generated by j. Uh, it's, it, x goes to x plus 2 pi is just like identity. Right? Because lo, let's look at the currents. J, jx is invariant. Jy is invariant. And uh, jz is invariant. Because it's just a shift. So currents are just left unchanged under the full 2 pi rotation. Okay? So it's generated by just the identity operation. Okay? Please. Yeah, yeah, it's true. We're saying that there is some now actually doing that will be very complicated. You see, because it's not like yeah, so there is another representation, as you say, in which there's some x prime in which jy is that. But to actually do that is complicated because you see, what you'll have to do is to take moment, momentum and winding modes in one representation and make them translation modes of the other. Yeah, so this thing must exist. But I don't know, I mean, I've never tried to actually do that. Yes, but your point is correct. Okay, now, how do we check this? This looks like a slick argument, but is it correct? Easy. In the last few classes, we found explicit expressions for the torus partition function of circle compactifications. And we've got explicit expression for the circle compactification, torus partition functions of orbifolds. If this is correct, those two partition functions should be the same. And when you take the orbifold theory at r equals square root 2, and the circle theory at r is equal to square root 2 by 2, or square root 2 times 2. OK, now these checks basically are quoting authority, citing authority. We've written down the partition functions. To know that they're the same, well, of course, one thing you can do is to take the answers we have, put it on Mathematica, and expand to 100th order. You'll find that they're the same. To prove that they're the same, you go to Jacobi and, I don't know, all, those, all these famous guys from famous centuries and uh, uh, <laughs> look up their identities, and you'll be able to find some identity which shows you that they're the same. Okay? It adds nothing to understanding unless we go through lectures or first I would have to understand why. Unless you go through, you know, the mathematical proofs, that's nothing for me to quote the name of the theorem. That shows that they're the same, I'm not even going to do that. Okay. Uh, you quote famous people and show that they're the same, or you expand to 100th order in mathematical. Is it, is it it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. But our argument was a complete argument. In fact, within string theory, is a non-perturbative argument. Uh, let me tell you why it's a non-perturbative argument. See, all our argument depended on was the uh, SU2 global symmetry. Okay? This is a slight aside. Okay, if you believe there's an SU2 global symmetry, it's just, it's, I mean, it had to be true. Okay? This is just a sanity check. The argument was more than the, the, the test. Okay, but I, I wanted to just give you a one minute uh, backup on string theory. Um, you see, within conformal field theory, this is true. But st in string theory, conformal field theory, I mean, since everyone in the class is a string theorist, right? I take it you're a string theorist. <laughs> OK, OK. So uh, uh, within string theory, conformal field theory is just a tool for doing perturbation theory. Right? You compute a full partition function, genus G partition function of the conformal field theory. All that does is compute a G loop graph Feynman diagram in space time. So you might think, perhaps, these two compactifications, namely compactification of space-time on S1 at radius square root, uh, square root 2 by 2, and compactification of, uh, of space-time uh, on an orbifold of radius square root 2, you might think these are maybe the same backgrounds in perturbation theory and string theory. Because how can conformal field theory teach you better than perturbation theory? But maybe non-perturbatively, 
uh, they might not be equal. You might have thought that that was a possibility. However, you see, this equivalence follows from SU2. And the, w the way that it would have to be violated is if, if this SU2 was violated. But you know, there's a, there's a rule in string theory. It says that global symmetries, uh, you know, dimension 1, comma, uh, 1, comma 0 and 0, comma 1 operators on the world sheet translate to gauge bosons in space time. And the global symmetry on the world sheet translates into gauge symmetry in space time. And violation of that global symmetry would amount to violation of the gauge symmetry in space time. And gauge symmetries, we believe, are sacred. Right? They're the, they are the Bhagavad Gita. Okay? You can't question them. Because, uh, because violating a gauge symmetry, or so we are told, leads to unitarity violation. Okay? So this argument is taken to be, is taken to imply that even non-perturbatively in string theory, these two backgrounds are the same. Now, of course, what I really mean is the equivalent things of the superstring. Because these are these are tachyons. Okay, so let's not do too much string theory here. But but uh, so so what I want to say is that the arguments, though it sounded like just words, is considerably more powerful than the partition function check. However, you must do these checks. Because sometimes these arguments are you miss something, and a check will reveal it. Okay, but it's just a sanity check. Okay, great. Uh, is this clear? And if you're not worried about unitarity, what? If you're not worried about unitarity, if you're not worried about unitarity, then you're a crackpot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You guys are all too young, but in 2001, we had a strings meeting in, 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 in TIFR, in fact, in Hobi Baba Auditorium. And Stephen Hawking came and gave a talk on a, on a theory that violated unitarity. And one of his statements was, unitarity is overrated. I don't care if it violates. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what do you say? Probabilities don't add up to one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Of course, nobody remembers that work now. Violated unitarity. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, uh, I mean, for space-time physics, of course. Okay. Now, there's a little bit more that I wanted to talk about uh, on the space of, you know, we're very near to giving a classification of all known C equals 1 theories. Perhaps all, the all C equals 1 theories. We've got, got almost all of them, but not quite all. Okay? Um, and I'm heading towards getting all of them. Okay. The first question you can ask is, well, we've got plenty of... Okay. I was focusing on these curtains. Please. Yes. C, C is the central charge? C central. All of these theories of C equals 1. Yeah, so how do you know the central charge of the orbifold theory? Uh, or, uh, the central charge of the orbifold theory is C equals 1 because the formula for the orbifold stress tensor is the same as for the unorbifold stress tensor. Right? Because the, untw the stress tensor is an operator in the untwisted sector. Untwisted sector operators that are invariant under x goes to minus x are just the same. But T is del x del x. So it's invariant under x goes to minus x. So it's just the same. So calculation is the same calculation. So it's the same central charge. OK? Yeah, I should have said that. Thank you. OK, excellent. Um, I, uh, OK, let's keep going. Now, uh, let's keep, keep our focus for a minute on this theory at um, uh, self dual radius, at r is equal to square root. Okay, so uh, this is our, uh, we've, we've, we're focused at the theory at r equals square root 2. And what we have seen is, um, uh, what we have seen is that when we orbifold this theory by Z, this Z2 orbifold, which is shrinking the circle, 
okay uh, then at that point there are about two inequivalent ways of moving away from this point you could go this way or you could go this way but that's what we're saying now you might let's try to understand this statement a little bit okay to start with, I'm going to start with this point. Why was there only one way of moving this way? Why was there only one way of moving that way? Even though there were many massless fields, many marginal operators around this point. This is the question we're going to try to address. Okay? Uh, root 2. Start with the root 2. You know, uh, we, we found two ways of going this way from a relatively less special point. The most special point is root 2. You might think that's the way that has most, you know, most fun. Okay? So, let me make my question more precise. What are the marginal operators around the root 2 point? First, we'll talk about marginal and then we'll worry about exactly marginal. Okay? What are the marginal operators around this point? Well, we know that we had these operators j which had dimension 1, 0. And we have the operators j bar that are dimension 0, 1. A marginal operator is an operator that is dimension 1, 1. So, j a j bar b, which I'll call m a b. Okay? j a j bar b, which, which I'll call m a b, are the set of marginal operators uh, dimension 1, 1 operators uh, around this point. And you might think that any combination of j, a, j bar b, okay, any linear combination of these will lead to a new line of conformal, of new conformal field theories. Now, not all of these will be equivalent, of course, because those that are related by SU2 times SU2 transformations um, will be equivalent. But still, there are nine MABs, because three into three, and only six parameters in SU2 times SU2. And therefore, you might think that there was a three-parameter set of inequivalent conformal field theories that should emerge from this point. So this argument went over. Sorry. See, suppose you've got genuinely, I mean, this will be, of course, the catch. They are not genuine, not all of them are genuinely margin. Uh, Suppose you've got a set of nine parameter set of genuinely marginal deformations of a fixed point. Then that leads to what is naively a nine parameter set of CFTs. You can deform in each direction. Each direction. Okay. However, of course, those theories that are related by symmetries, it's an overkill to call them different theories. So if you've got a deformation, and another deformation that is related to the original deformation by a symmetry. Then we will call that the same deformation. The partition functions will be the same for instance. All physics is related. Now, how many symmetries did we have? We had, um, um, we had three here on SU2 left and three on SU2 right. So we've got this nine parameter manifold. At most, we can have a six parameter set equivalence on this nine parameter manifold. That leaves three parameters left. These three parameters, changing these three parameters, cannot be symmetry related, just by counting. So it would appear that we might think that from this point, we should have a nine, a, an at least three parameter set of inequivalent fixed points. Where is, did the six comes from? In this? Six, because SU2 has group dimension three, okay. and the other SU2 also has group dimension three. Right? Now, I mean, there could be less because it could be that, you know, some typical point is annihilated by some of these generators. But it can't be more. Is this clear? Okay. Now, you might think, well, 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 before making such conclusions, let's check it at a slightly more familiar point. Let's look at circle compactifications at an arbitrary point. Now, at an arbitrary point, how many marginal operators do we have? We know of one. Del x, del by x. De, uh, 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 not stress tensor. Del x, del x is stress tensor. This is del x, del by x. It's not holomorphic. Okay. Del x, del by x is 
there is one marginal deformation and it corresponds to changing the radius of the, the circle. Why is del x del by x the operator that corresponds to changing the radius of the circle? Let's explain that. You see, our theory was 1 by, pa, uh, 1 by 8 pi square root del alpha x del alpha x where x goes to x plus 2 pi r. Now, suppose, suppose I add to this plus epsilon del, okay, this is same as del x del by x, right? In holomorph, there may be a 2 that I'm not worrying about. Okay, I add to this del x del by x. So now what my theory becomes is 1 over 8 pi times 1 plus epsilon into del x del by x. Now this looks like a different action, right? There was an 8 pi here, 1 plus epsilon 8 pi here. But I can go back to the same action just by making, by doing a scaling. Which is x goes to, uh, goes to x prime into 1 minus epsilon by 2. To first order in epsilon. Okay, rewriting this in terms of x prime. Okay, rewriting this in terms of x prime makes this 1 by 8 pi d x prime d x prime bar. What is the price we paid by doing this? Price we paid is we changed the identification. Okay, because now x prime over, you know, into 1 plus epsilon by 2 is equal to x prime plus 2, uh, 2 pi, uh, x prime into 1. 1 plus epsilon by 2 into plus 2 pi r. So I'll multiply and divide by 1 plus epsilon by 2. It's the same as multiplying by, I'm sorry, plus 2 pi r. I'll multiply by 1 minus epsilon by 2 into 1 plus epsilon by 2. To first order, this is identity. And then this I absorb into here. So you see, I've effectively changed the radius as r goes to r. Uh, it changes by r into epsilon by 2. So changing the radius and adding this operator is, to the Lagrangian is the same operation. Is this clear? Okay. So at an ordinary circle compactification point, there was exactly one marginal operator. And that corresponded to that one operation we knew of, the one line of conformal field theories we knew of, namely changing the radius. Okay, very satisfying. It looks like. If it was true, then this diagram is total nonsense. So it's not true, but I have to tell you why. Okay, but this is the puzzle. Is this clear? Now, of course, the resolution to this is that we're being too fast. And how are we being too fast? We're being too fast because we are pretending. Okay. Uh, we are pretending that in order to get a new line of conformal field theories, it's sufficient to have a marginal operator, meaning sufficient to have a dimension one, one comma one operator. But that's not true, right? You see, this is sort of sufficient infinitesimally. But at next order, the, this, this deformation has to be marginal, not in that uh, the original theory, but in the original theory, deformed by epsilon of this operator. Okay, and so on. So having an exactly marginal deformation, having an exactly marginal deformation is much more than having a marginal deformation. We can say this in terms of the beta function. If we add a little bit of, a, of, of, a, of an operator to the theory, the fact that it's dimension zero tells you that the beta function for the flow of this of coefficient of this operator vanishes at linear order. But need not vanish at quadratic order and cubic order. And high. Okay. So in order to see what, in order to see, answer. <laughs> I need a better system. <laughs>
Uh, in order to s sorry. <laughs> in order to see what dimensionality we really have, what we have to do is to compute the beta function for adding an MAB. Is this clear? Okay. Now, beta function computations to all orders are, is very tough. But to first order and conformal perturbation theory is simple. This computation has been done. I'm going to give you the answer. Okay? Much of it largely follows from, from symmetry. In fact, you know, at least at first order, at least at qu quadratic order, there is this theorem that all beta functions are gradient flow. They are derivatives of a gradient flow function. This matches to the to the fact in space time that um, that conditions for conformal invariance come from an action. <laughs> okay, that's a gradient flow of, of the thing. That thing is the space time action. Okay, and the gradient flow. Yes. If you could show that it's gradient flow with a positive definite metric, it would imply the C theorem. Okay. You know, in string theory, you can work out, for the sigma model, you can work out this metric. And it's not positive definite in the sector, including the, including the dilettante. This is a subject that's actually very confusing, in, including people, including myself, have written papers on this. Uh, and it's very confusing because many people have said wrong things about this. Many people claim that. <laughs> OK, so it's a confusing subject. But we're not, at the moment, interested in positivity. OK? So. Apart from the metric, which I'm, you don't want to, yeah. del MAB by del log lambda is gradient flow of some, some uh, uh, potential function. Okay, so there's some G A B A prime B prime. This is the metric on the gradient flow, and then there's del by del M A prime B prime of some potential function V. This potential function is a function that has to be um, uh, that has to be both actually the potential function and this g function have to be separately invariant under SU2 times SU2. Okay? I am interested, actually that forces the g function to be a trivial function. A with A prime, B with B prime, delta functions. Okay, so that g function is a trivial thing in this case. Okay? But I'm interested in the potential function. What? Um, well, this guy has to be covariant, but this has to be invariant. Just one guy. Right? G is covariant. So it's a bunch of delta functions, delta A prime, delta B, B prime. Right? I mean, it's just that. OK, so it's covariant, yes. But louder, louder. Symmetric because of SU2 symmetry. Right, every everything in this theory, including its beta functions, have to preserve SU2 symmetry. SU2 times SU2. Okay. However, this V one can calculate. Now, I want something that will whose derivatives will generate beta functions at quadratic order. So this something has to be, something has to be cubic. Okay. Can you think of? any object that is cubic in MAB and that is invariant under SU2 rota left rotations on A and SU2 right rotations on B. Sounds almost impossible, right? Determinant. But there is one thing. This is debt B. Debt M has that property. You see, because the left and right guys are different SU2s, you cannot multiply two M's. M square is not invariant because it would require contracting, uh, you know, indice, at least if you keep going, M to the N is not invariant because the indices you want to contract are different indices. Okay? But this guy is a nice invariant object. Okay? Because determinants have the property that, they, that under determinant of A, M, B is debt A, A times debt M times debt B. And all SU2 matrices have determinant 1. Okay? So 
This quantity, if you think about it, basically from symmetry, there's only one thing that could have been. And this is what you find. V is proportional to the de determinant of it. Okay. So our beta functions have this form. Okay. So V is equal to delta. Okay. Now, we, the flow directions, the directions in which you are actually allowed to flow, are those in which this beta function vanishes. So, can it be a general function of delta? Yeah, yeah, it could be, but we want cubic. We want cubic because it's, uh, uh, we want the quadratic term in the beta function. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what, what we want is now to look at what direct, what kind of configurations of M, you know, what kind of configurations of M uh, preserve this, uh, have our beta function non-zero. Okay? Now, let's see. So, what we need is some kind of M's such that around that del det m by del m a b is equal to 0 for all a and b. Right, that's when the beta functions will be 0. What? We want to know what m's will have this property such that around those m's, the derivative of det m with respect to m is 0. Because we want the beta functions to be 0. We are looking for margin, exactly marginal directions. We are looking for a family of conformal field theories. So, the, we, in, when we turn on this operator, we should be able to flow without generating additional RG flow. Just that should be like a fixed point by itself. Because we want, not fixed point is the wrong lines, fixed line, fixed manifold. It's a manifold of there. Excellent. Okay. Now, by SU2 times SU2 rotations, you can take any M and diagonalize it. Okay. So, this M is going to be of the form some alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay. Now, let's take the derivative of this with respect to alpha. Of determ so, the determinant then is alpha, beta, gamma. Take the derivative, we have to have all derivatives vanishing. Derivative with respect to alpha has to vanish. That tells you either beta or gamma is 0. Okay. Uh, derivative with respect to um, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, uh, yeah, let's let's take the limit after after taking derivative. So let's take the derivative with respect to alpha. Suppose I take derivative with respect to alpha, del v by del alpha. This is equal to beta gamma. And similarly, now the only configuration in which all of these right hand sides vanish is a configuration in which at least two of alpha and beta gamma are zero. If one is zero, that's not good enough. Right, because the derivative of the guy that was zero would be non-zero. Okay, so the only configurations for which this is exactly marginal are those that are SU two times SU two equivalent to alpha zero zero. Is this clear? Okay, is this clear? One can do this a little more systematically. The points should be clear. Please go on. Yes. That gives me determinant m times m. Yeah. It will give you a subdeterminant basically. Uh -huh, right. so, no. so you want everything to basically you want matrices with rank 1. So every 2 cross 2 subdeterminant vanishes. Ah, I see. Okay. But rank 1 is okay. equivalent to this. Uh, I see. Okay. That's another way of saying it. Okay. Right. So Karthik's way is take the derivative of the determinant. With respect to an element, you get the subdeterminant. So every subdeterminant vanishes, you're done. 
uh, subdeterminants are 2 cross 2. If the matrix had rank 1, all 2 cross 2 subdeterminants vanish by definition. But every rank 1 matrix can be a SU2 times a SU2 made into this. Well, that's another, maybe a more elegant way of saying it. Yeah. That doesn't matter. We don't, okay. Well, well, actually, determinant of m equals 0, that doesn't matter. We want to know whether motion in that direction, whether there is flow or not. The beta function is not proportional to v, it's proportional to derivatives of v. All the derivatives have to vanish. Okay? So the value of v doesn't matter. That we can even shift, you know, by an additive constant. It's the derivatives that matter. Okay, so whether we're sitting pretty or you're being forced by a force to move. Right. Okay, is this clear? Yes? yes so this is true for any value of R, right? No, no, this MAB is even marginal only at this value of R. You see, the reason by computing one loop, namely this, Q, this uh, the reason by computing the quadratic term in the beta function is that the beta function vanished at linear order. By computing the first potentially non-vanishing time. At every other value of r, the only marginal operator is del x del x, del x del by x. And del x del by x we know is exactly marginal. Why do we know it's exactly marginal? Because we've constructed the conformal field theories on the whole line. But at 2 root 2, will there be a new operator? Hang on. That's, we, we're going to look at that in a minute. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but by symmetry, why should the AZ be the exactly marginal? Uh, in, nothing wrong with uh, Everything is SU2 times SU2 equivalent to this. Not necessarily JZ. Any, but you're not going to get a new conformal field theory. Because all rank 1 determinants are this up to SU2 times SU2 transform. You get something, but it's the same thing. Okay, we're only classifying things that are different, you know, have different answers. It's a matter of representation then. Okay, it's like what uh, Om Omkar was asking, you write in some other variables, but it's the same theory. Okay, we're only classifying things up to, you know, we want different partition functions, different correlation functions. Otherwise, we won't call it a different theory. Okay, great, excellent. But in fact, Chintan and Vinit's question take us to the next point. Okay, all rank one matrices are the same, and this rank one matrix we can put by SU2 times SU2 transformations to del x del x, and so the only deformation is changing the circle radius. That's why this representation here was correct. So only one way to go. One. One way it is. And that can be put into JZ, JZ, like I've done in this matrix, which is del x, del x, del by x. All clear? Okay. Now let's address the Vinit Chintan question about what happens, you know, at, yeah. So now let's look at what happens to this beta function. What happens to this potential? Um, uh, what happens to this potential um, at uh, uh, when we do an x goes to x uh, and x goes to x by 2 or befold of this theory? Sorry, x goes to x plus 2 pi r by 2, where r is square root 2. X go, the z2 or before that will take this theory to the circle compactification, not at square, ra radius square root 2, but at radius square root 2 by r, by 2. Okay? Now, you see, all of these operators, these, um, uh, jx, jx, j, jx, jy, um, these, uh, 
first question is what part of m here survives okay so we had m you you remember was mab was equal to ja j bar b and you remember that under this transformation jz was left invariant okay but jx picked up a minus y sign and jy picked up a minus sign we're doing in the representation where the trans where it was rotation around the z axis by pi clear so which of these will be invariant will lie in the untwisted sector of this new z2 orbifold well clearly jx jx will so mzz and also we will have uh, we will have jx jx and also anything with only y and z, uh, x and y okay so our m matrix now about this new point ah uh, our uh, m matrix here itself takes the following form 0 0 around this new theory okay these are the only massless operators that 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 exist around this new theory okay the calculation of the beta function once again gives you the same answer del determinant of a, of this m okay it often happens that things in the untwisted sector when you in an orbifold theory get the same answer as in the unorbifold theory but just restricted to those states that obey the orbifold projection this often happens in fact in some cases there are theorems that this happens okay anyway in this case it happens clear okay so now it's uh, the the theorem the theorem i would have to state it more clearly okay i could state it more clearly the theorem is this that in in a uh, if you take an orbifold and you work in the untwisted sector and all your operate so all you look at correlation functions all of which are in the untwisted sector okay then the correlators of those operators are the same as the correlators of those untwisted sector operators okay um in the uh, parent theory okay there's some descent relation the re the reason for that is that in the op twisted sector operators cannot appear because they can only appear in pairs because there's this quantum symmetry you know uh, we'll even talk about this at some point okay but at the moment i just wanted this will throw away remark to motivate that this form of this beta function does not change okay so once again we have this uh, um you know once again we have this um uh this uh, uh this kind of a uh, uh, constraint you know our our matrix tells us that a matrix has to be rank 2 uh, rank 1 in order to satisfy the beta function equation okay but now there are two different kinds of rank 1 matrices there's this guy and then there's this guy this guy can be rotated to this guy by the u1 times u1 transformations so2 times so2 transformations that are preserved once we orbifold by jz rotations by pi is not there because exactly exactly because see what we've done is taken a theory which had su2 times su2 and rotate by a jz rotation by pi Times jz rotation by pi. So the only part of the su2 times su2 that survives is those su2 su2 elements that commute with this particular orbifold. That includes, in particular, the so2, which is x y uh, rotations around the z axis, and basically that. It's basically rotations around the z axis. So now there is nothing that will allow you to rotate an element in the x y two two cross two block to an element in the top block. so these are different okay and it's this guy that corresponds to changing the radius whereas the other guy which corresponds to going up this orbifold what is this second matrix this i'm giving uh, exam i'm giving the 
two inequivalent configurations that will obey the zero beta function equations. This guy and this guy, both are rank one. Both are rank one, but they're not equivalent anymore because there's no symmetry rota rotate between the two. Okay? This one, there's an SO2 times SO2. Yeah, we can, you can rotate around the x, y axis of both on left and right. Okay? This is why we have two independent directions. Is this clear? Please go. Loud, a little loud. You see, all, we want to look for all M matrices that obey the zero, uh, zero beta function condition. Okay? All M matrices that obey the zero beta function conditions are things which are diagonal, if you think in this way. But there's only one non-zero diagonal element. That diagonal element could be here, or here, or here. Here and here are equivalent under SO2 rotations. But here and here are not equivalent. Yeah, they're, they're not symmetry, symmetry equivalent. So we've got two symmetry inequivalent deformations. That gives us our two branches. Is this clear? The second deformation is like j, y, j, y. It is like j, y, j, y. Or j, uh, j, j, x, j, x, I think is what we called it. Right? Any linear combination. OK? First deformation corresponds to changing the radius of the... Of the circle theory. Second deformation uh, change, uh, turns, uh, is changing the radius of the orbifold theory. Oh, so beta function argument, uh, beta function argument yes, we saw this anyway, but we see why it's reasonable from this beta function point of view. There were two inequivalent deformations. Is this clear? Rajat, clear? Okay, excellent. Now, Now, there's one more thing we can do. I'm aiming to completely tell you about the space of C equals 1 theories. What's left is some niggly extra points, some points that don't lie anywhere, but, but we'll build up to those. Okay, uh, fine. Now, another thing that might be worrying you is the following. Look, we had all this fun Oh, we had all this uh, excitement that died away around this SU2 point because we found lots of these marginal operators and we thought maybe we've got a whole zoo of new theories. Turned out to be wrong, uh, except for this guy. But okay, now you might think, look, what about, what about not working around um, this Not working around the circle of radius square root 2, but working around the square, uh, circle of radius square root 2 times n. Somebody asked this at some point. So we've looked at square root 2 and we've looked at 2 square root 2. But what about n square root 2? Is something interesting going to happen when we work around the circle of radius n square root 2? Let's look at that. Okay. So our... Um, uh, our spectrum was PL was equal to N by R plus minus omega R by 2. Uh, uh, no, no. Uh, omega R by, by alpha prime and 2, right? By 2, yeah. I think this is right. Uh, omega R by 2. And P, P left right was equal to this. Okay. Now you can ask, if we set R is equal to n by square root 2, what do we get? So we get n by square root 2 plus minus um, omega n by, uh, by the whole thing by square root 2. What? Louder. Uh, look, uh, is this any 
what this is the momentum this is winding no, 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 the momentum and, and the radius and root 2 n root 2 n oh thank you <laughs> thank you uh, p thank you can you distinguish let's call it q q and my n may look too similar uh, r times q and r by thank you n by q and r times q thank you thank you thank you okay okay now let us look at um, let us look at uh, I wanted two. I, I want to get some new massless states. Okay, I'll check. What is it? There's a. I suppose we want n is equal n is equal to q or something like that. But just give me a minute. There are some new massless states at these points. Ah, 2q. Well, uh, Zn orbifold. <laughs> yeah, excellent. That's where we're going. But hang on for a minute. So suppose we take n is equal to plus minus q and omega equals 0. Look at these, these states. OK? These states have PL equals PR is equal to uh, 2, uh, root 2, right? Because we took 2 q. Ah, I, I wanted it to be massless, right? OK? Now, you know the dimensions of operators is k square by 2. Since we've got this root 2, we're going to get 1 comma 1. OK? So these states are uh, marginal states. This state is a 1 comma 1 operator. OK? This looks like a new 1 comma 1 operator. It's different from del x, del by x. So it looks like at every value of, of n times, or p times square root 2, we have the possibility of having a new line going out. Because there's a new marginal operator. Okay. So question. Question. Okay. Does this line exist? Okay. And to answer this question, once again we have to ask: Is this line marginal or exactly marginal? Okay. So once again, we. Do, oh sorry. One thing I should have said before all of this was that we. Uh, we, we looked at beta functions only to cubic order, oh, quad quadratic order. Okay. Now, uh, you might have wondered, what if the beta function vanishes at, at quadratic order but is a non-zero at cubic order? That in many cases is a real worry. But you see, we didn't have to worry about that because so far everything that we have found that was allowed by this cubic potential or quadratic beta function was actually an exact conformal field. Since we knew there was a construction of an exact conformal field theory at every value of circle radius, or exact conformal field theory at every value of orbifold radius, we know that along those directions, beta function is going to vanish to all orders. Okay? Had we found more, we would have had to worry. Okay, but since we found only these, there was nothing else to do. Is this clear? Okay? Fine. Fine. So now that we. Uh, um, uh, okay. So, so basically what we do once again is look at the beta function along this direction. Okay? Once again what we want to do is to look at the beta function along this direction. But how do we how do we do that? Okay? And the way we do that is once again by doing what Chintan was suggesting. Chintan's proposal was take this theory with n times the radius and regard it as an Zn orbifold 
of the cell, the stereo cell fuel radius. Just modding out by x goes to x plus 2 pi square root 2 by n. What? Before it was a z2 orbifold, zn orbifold. Right? Because these are n different shifts you have to mod out by. Okay? Of course, there is always this irritating thing that when I say I'm modding out by the shift, I'm working in one T dual frame, and this radius is in the opposite T dual frame. But mentally, you can translate between the two, right? Okay? So this is what we have. We have this. Uh, um, uh, we have this. So this theory was, is basically the self dual theory modded out by the Zn twists, by the Zn. Uh, uh, by the Zn shifts, okay, and once again we can use that to compute the beta to uh, compute the beta function for this deformation, okay, because we regard this deformation as a deformation in the self dual theory, okay, modded out. We get the same v function and look at its beta functions. Okay, let me leave this to you as an exercise. I let me leave this to you as an exercise, which we'll look at next time, just to make sure you're doing something at home. Use the same logic that we used for the for this guy to show that there is no that there is no extra line. Okay. So in the earlier case, you were able to model by Z2 because we were identifying like we were we we have two identities. That's why we were able to. That's why we were able to relate one thing to another. But the, to mod to get that original Z two shift didn't require that second shift identification. It was just that we had x goes to x plus two pi r, and on that we did an extra shift x goes to x plus pi r. No, but that x plus pi r was coming because of this. Uh, or before no, it was coming just because a radius of half the size. It's just one extra identification compared to the radius of the full size. That had nothing to do with x goes to minus x. Okay, we used we used SU two times SU two to show, to show that that was the same as x goes to minus x. That's another step in the in the argument. But the fact that you could do this ident orbit folding was independent of that. Is this clear? Right? It's just the fact that if it's just this that I can. Say I have a, I want a circle of radius one. I first make a circle of radius n, and then do identifications by one nth of the rotations, one nth around the circle. That gives you a circle of radius one. It's just that statement. Is that clear? Okay, that's just that simple geometrical statement. Is all, all we're talking about. Yes. Yes. No, this is no. There's no x goes to minus x. No, no, no. Let me do that. Right. Uh, will will we be able to do this? Uh, 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 this uh, uh, will we get an x goes to minus x? No, you, no. There will be nothing of nothing of that sort. The, the only this, this will be the only orbifold possible. In fact, uh, when you go through this little exercise, yeah. In fact, you see because we're preserving less symmetry. Um, okay, excellent. Uh, let, let me come back to that right at the end. Okay, I just want to finish telling you the story and then we come back to this. Okay, so this is the first thing that we, you know, there were these additional orbifolds by Zn of the self of the self dual circle radius. Okay, they just landed us on if we take this self dual radius. And we orbifold by Z3 or Z4 or Z5. We get these points, but they're not new conformal field theories. They were just already on this line of circle compactifications. The potential for something new would have been if we could find a new line up here. But because of the exercise you're going to do at home, that those don't exist. There's nothing. Yeah, that's basically what your beta function calculation is going to show. That's just this. Okay. Now, 
Similarly, you could take this, uh, this theory and orbifold by x goes to minus x, this rotation around the x-axis and uh, uh, translation kind of rotations, these guys. And you will generate new orbifold, I mean you will, these, these, these orbifolds, these are called d-type orbifolds. Let me say it clear, more clearly. What I'm trying to do is the following. I'm trying to understand everything you can get by orbifolding the SU2 times SU2 theory by any finite group of SU2, by any finite subgroup of SU2. Okay? That's the exercise we are undertaking. We saw that these Zn orbifolds, these finite subgroups which are just cyclical groups, Z uh, rotations by 2 pi, uh, 2 pi by n, okay, rotations by 2 pi by n generated this guy. This guy, especially these motions, were generated by reflections, right? x goes to minus x. Okay, now there are subgroups which are rotations plus reflections. These are called, by people who know such things, these are called the AN series, I think. Karthik will correct me. I think these are called the DN series. These, rota these subgroups which are rotations plus reflections. DN, somebody, you know. It depends. So D, D for depends. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. What, 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 what I say again? Yes, but now we apply a different Z, not a commuting Z. Yeah, not, not a commuting. Yes, so Z2 times Z. Then X goes to minus X is Z2 around the XY axis, uh, rotational, and you have the other Z. Absolutely. Uh, and in addition, people who know such things know that there are three other isolated, meaning not those that appear in series, finite subgroups of SU2. These are called the, I'll read out their names, tetrahedral, binary, binary, octahedral, and binary icosahedral subgroups, finite subgroups of SU2. <laughs> Is that correct, Akarthi? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, orbifolding by these guys, Or be folding by the original, these, these familiar subgroups, cyclical rotations and rotations plus reflections, okay, landed us on points that we already knew before. They were just special points of this continuous moduli space. Didn't give us anything new, okay. The interesting question here was that at these points, can we find new marginal directions analogous to this? Okay, and you're going to argue here, and there's a similar argument here, that the answer is no, from the beta function. Okay, in addition, there are these three exceptional points, which are not on this line. They're just by themselves, and they have no marginal deformations whatsoever. Still of, the of the SU2. You see, whenever you've got a, a theory with a symmetry, with a finite subgroup symmetry, your finite symmetry, discrete, discrete group symmetry, you are allowed to orbifold by it. Nothing stops you from doing that. Okay? So what we're doing is producing all the theories we can get by orbifolding this SU2 theory by all its discrete subgroups. The A-type series gave us new theories, but they were already on the line that we already knew. The D-type series gave us new theories already on this line. These are genuinely new theories. They're not part of any, any moduli space, they don't have any marginal. marginal directions. They're just on their own. <laughs> okay? And that's it. This is the full set of known theories, perhaps the full set of theories. Full set of theories I know, but maybe the full set of theories that, that can be. Okay? I'm not, I've not seen a proof, but uh, maybe there exists one. Yeah. 
This is certainly the full set of things you can get by starting with SU2. But the question is, could there be C equals 1 theories that you get from some other route? Huh? Yeah, as far as, uh, as I could well be, I should look around. It could well be that there is a proof that this is the full set. Certainly, it's the full set of known theories. Widely believed that it's a full set of C equals 1 theories that exist. So here we have accomplished what is, you know, a holy grail in physics, if you could accomplish it in more generality. That is to classify all fixed points of the renormalization group. I'm looking like a politician, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, it's a grand and great problem in theoretical physics to classify all unitary fixed points of the renormalization group. This is a problem that has some similarities with the question of classifying all Lie algebras. That has proved so powerful in the study of symmetry. If you could classify all fixed points of the renormalization group in every dimension, that will certainly prove as powerful in the study of the kind of physics that involves continuum physics, right? It gives you the all, all possible behaviors of phase, unitary phase transitions, for instance. All possible RG flows away from that will give you all possible quantum field theories. It's like Disneyland. Here, in this very minimalistic way, focusing on theories with C equals 1, in two dimensions, we have classified. In the next few lectures, we will classify all theories with C less than 1. Even in two dimensions, the classifications of theories with C greater than 1 is terra incognita. It's a wild terrain, nobody knows the answer. Okay? But still, the fact that we could do it for C equals 1 and really also for C less than 1 gives you hope, right? Okay. Okay, let me stop here. And uh, we, from next class on, we will go through this little exercise we talked about. And then we will start with our discussion of C less than 1, namely the study of minimal models. Oh, give me. I wish. Just somebody. Give me one minute. I wanted, I wanted to say one last thing since I don't want to postpone that to next class. I'll just try to get this wire in. Give me one minute. There's one leftover thing. No, I, I think it's just pushing this wire into this groove. It should be within my ability, maybe. Okay, it's not within my ability. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I might. Okay, at least it's half pushed. Okay, yeah. So, um, let, let me say one last thing that was motivated by a question that Aryaman had asked me last time. Uh, because you're going to hear these things and you should know the relationship. The question is, in our study of bosonization, just wrapping up our study of C equals 1 theories. Okay? In our study of bosonization, we looked at this duality between the theory at uh, R equals 2, boson at R equals 2, and uh, complex fermion. Okay, these two theories were equivalent as quantum field theory, as conformal field theories. But now, whenever you have a duality between two conformal field theories, that duality induces a whole web of new, a whole manifold of new dualities. Because if you can take the conformal field theory and perturb it by a marginal or relevant operator, then there is a corresponding marginal or relevant operator on the other side because the theory is dual. And the RG flow is generated, uh, the, the CFT is generated by the exactly marginal operator, or the RG flow is generated by the relevant operator, are dual to each other. So CFT dualities induce new dualities man for manifolds worth of field theories corresponding to every marginal or relevant operator. Is this clear? A general fact about CFTs, about quantum field theories. Okay, now in this case, we can try to implement this philosophy. Okay, in this case, we can try to implement this philosophy and we can ask, first, can we identify any, any marginal operators on both sides? On the fermionic side, you might be a bit puzzled. What is a marginal operator corresponding to fermions, free fermions? But on the bosonic side, we know a marginal operator. 
it's just this, right? Moving in the radius direction. Okay? So first we can very easily promote this set of dualities to one line set of dualities. Okay. Now what? On the bosonic side, the, 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 the change was just changing the radius. Nothing. Remains a free theory. What is that change on the fermionic side? Well, we've already seen that the, the operator that generates the change of radius was del, del x del by x. But you remember that in our study, del x was the current, which mapped to psi psi bar. And del by x was the current that mapped to psi tilde psi tilde bar. Therefore, on the fermion side, you should expect this new line to be generated by adding psi psi bar psi tilde psi tilde bar. Okay? This thing is called the Thiering model. The theory of psi bar del, uh, psi bar del psi plus psi, psi tilde del, this del bar, this del psi tilde bar plus psi psi bar psi tilde psi tilde bar. This has a name, this theory has a name, it's called the Thiering model. Okay? And it may not be clear when you looked at it. This, this psi psi bar, psi tilde, psi tilde bar is clearly marginal. It may not be clear that it's exactly marginal. Why is it clearly marginal? Because each of these has dimension half. So ha two halves on the left, two halves on the right. So it's one comma one. Okay? But it may not be clear that it's exactly marginal. But from the duality with the boson, we see that it is. Okay? So this one parameter line of theory is generated by adding this interaction on the fermions is dual to taking this boson at this fun particular radius and changing the radius. Okay, so G is proportional to change in radius. Clear? Good. That was on the marginal side. What about on the relevant side? Okay. On the relevant side, okay, on the relevant side, well, there's one obvious relevant operator in any theory, namely adding a mass. Okay? And now, mass on the boson side involves adding the x operator, which we didn't like. You know, it was a deformation by an operator which, are, which around the conformal point was a bit singular. Right? Because x squared is not a good operator. But mass on the fermion side was just adding a psi psi bar. That's like a good operator. Okay, so clear good relevant deformation of these conformal field theories is obtained by giving the fermions a mass. Okay, so that is plus, um, how will it go? Something like psi, psi, psi tilde plus psi bar, psi tilde bar. Something like this will be the mass operator. Masses are uh, mix left and right movers. And they break this, this, this separation of the theory into left movers and right movers. Okay. What is this operator dual to on the boson side? Okay. So psi, if you remember, was e to the power i square root 2. No, was e to the power i phi. Let's say the boson is called phi. Huh? And this was a left mover, but we also have a psi tilde. So that makes left mover plus right mover, so it just makes it phi. Okay? And we've got this plus, which is with the minus, so e to, plus e to the palm, minus phi, which is like cos phi. Okay? So adding the mass on this side, is like adding a cosine phi potential on the other side, on the on the fermionic side, on the bosonic side. So the bosonic theory with deformed radius and a cosine phi potential. Phi now deformed so that it's periodic under the right, you know, with a number so that it's periodic under the right thing. Okay, this bosonic theory has a name. It's called the sine Gordon model. Okay, the sine Gordon model has a potential, so it doesn't look free. But what we're seeing here is that if we didn't do the G deformation, that is if we, if we worked at the radius R equals 2, the sine modern model 
is actually secretly a free theory. Because it's the same as fermion theory deformed by a mass. It's a massive theory, but a free one. Okay? The sign got... That's not a CFT, is it? Not a CFT, but a free theory, free quantum field theory. Yes, it's a theory with a mass cap. The sign Gordon theory, a general radius, continues to be a massive theory. But in this case, there is no exact description from it from what we know. Because even on the fermionic side, it's a mass deformation of an interacting theory. Okay? Nonetheless, these theories are all turn out to be integrable theories. So for the sign Gordon theories, you can... Uh, using the techniques of integrability, you can more or less solve the theory. Okay, but this, wh what I want to do, uh, first, the, the po point of this, this was to say two things. First, to throw these names at you. Condensed matter people will often talk to you about sign gordon thering duality. Okay, sign gordon thering duality is nothing but the RNG flows that follow from bosonization. Okay, conceptually trivial. You've understood bosonization, you've understood sign gordon thering. The duality. Yes. Yes. That is marginal. Yes. Yes. Adding. The the yes. The del x del by x, which was marginal, which was marginal, that was clear on the bosonic side, it was also marginal on the fermionic side. It was less obvious. Then there was adding the mass term on both both sides, that corresponds to a relevant deformation. Yes, but both these deformations keep the theory uh, free. No. No. Adding the fermionic mass and changing the bosonic radius keeps the theory free. Not conformal, but free. Just so you, there are two things that keep it free. Either making the marginal deformation and not turning on the sign potential or the cost potential. Uh, the, sorry, making making the, the yeah. So two things keep it free. First, changing the radius, which is the same thing as adding this g, psi, psi, whatever. That keeps it free. That's a conformal field theory and it remains free. Second, keep, don't do this deformation and turn on a fermion in mass. That is also free. But if you do both of them, it's not free. In fact, the sine Gordon model has a very interesting S matrix at the general values of the radius. It's far from free. But an S matrix that is exactly known because of, because of uh, duality. But you see there are two things. One is being able to solve a theory. Another is to be able to know, is to know that two theories are the same even though you can't solve either one of them. Okay? In this full two parameter set, we know the second thing. The fermionic theory with this G deformation and a mass is the same as the sign Gordon theory, and we know the map between parameters. Those things we know are the same theories. The fact that we are going to have to work hard to solve either of them is another matter. Okay? And then on these two lines, they're just free. Okay? So, so sometimes, you know, notice that there is this feature. So let's last and I'll stop. Let's do radius deformation and mass deformation. This is a bad, bad notation because radius deformation in the bosonic language and mass deformation in the fermionic language. Okay, this line is, this was marginal direction. This was a marginal thing to do. This was a relevant thing to do. Okay, we got a line of CFTs, each of which has a relevant deformation. Okay. Now, this description is free in, in fermionic language. Right? Because it's just a fermion with a mass. This description is free in bosonic language. Okay? In the middle, somewhere here, is free in neither language. But if you're near here, the bosonic description is a better description. An easier description. If you're near here, the fermionic description is an easier description. Okay? If you're right in the middle, you have to trust the Zama logic curves to solve the theory for you by integrable. <laughs> okay? This often happens with duality, right? You've got the space of theories. 
And so one, one description is useful here, another description useful there, and somewhere in the middle, nothing's useful. Okay. That's all I wanted to say. Questions or comments? Then we. Yes. Louder, louder. Uh, if I take the limit theory of the ZQ orbital folding uh, Q going to infinity, does that give me a well-behaved? Yeah, I, I, okay, uh, this ZQ, yeah. You will just go to a larger, larger radius. Let me see where we are. I see. And, I mean, is the limit something? It's free, free, oh. decompactified both. Oh. Right? We just look at that, right? That's not similar to the R equal to infinity in the R equals infinity. The R equals infinity in orbifolding will be decompact by theory with one orbifold. Actually, with two orbifolds, but the second one has infinity. So the orbifolds are still there. Right. When you go along this line, yes. uh, when you reach two square root, two, there is one more marginal relevant operator. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly the same story. So that, that's the D type thing. Yeah. That's Wait, wait, wait. Say again. Now you're talking. Sorry, you're talking about the left. This, this graph. This graph. You start from r equals to two, then you go to r equals to two. Ah. So there is one more. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, you start here and go here. You're saying. Right? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So you start here and go here. There will be one more marginal operator, and you want to know what it is in fermionic language. That is your question. Um. Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is the question of what is JYJY in the Fermionic language, right? Uh, let me think. I don't. I don't often know. Um, it. Uh, yeah. Okay. You see. We actually we do know because uh, e to the power i phi was psi. Um, it's looking very. It looks like there is another combination of psi and psi, another quartic combination. You see, uh, because e to the power i phi was psi, and uh, if you want to make uh, uh, j as. Uh, uh, Harshit said that what you want is basically jx, jx, or jy, jy, whatever. jx, jx, let's say. Um, so what you want is e to the power i phi plus e to the power minus i phi. Okay? So this looks, uh, but that times, uh, no, e to the power i phi times e to the power minus i phi. Now, e to the power i phi was psi quadratic. quadratic, yeah. e to the power i phi was psi. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I phi plus e to the power minus i phi. But we want to do it left and right. So we want i phi left plus e to the power minus i phi left times e to the power i phi right plus e to the power minus i phi right. Right? Am I getting these numbers right? That is the question. Uh, uh, it should have been this phi. I'm going to have to work it out. It could be that this is like phi psi square. We have to check these numbers. I suspect this is going to be like psi square, psi bar square. It, it's some, I suspect it's going to be another quartic operator. Well, but should be easy to work out. I don't, I don't know the answer. OK, excellent question. Okay, Quest uh, any other questions or comments? Okay, fine. So we've had a, uh, uh, we've had a thorough introduction to, to C equals 1 theories. There's one more thing I would have liked to tell you about, but I don't want to delay the minimal model discussion anymore. The one, one other thing I would like to tell you about is lattice compactifications of larger C theories. We'll come back to that at some other point, maybe when we study Kachmudi algebra.